there yeah i was just logged in logged in in my personal account this is my uh this is my work account they let me use this for uh they let me use this for education purposes so that um and it and of course it's not subject to the standard one hour limit that most uh that uh, the free version of zoom uh, sticks you with So with that in mind, let me just share my screen one more time, just to show you what I'm going to do is I'm going to bump up my font size a little as well. Just to show you, just to give you a feeling of how much code there is for that simple game. It's actually not a lot. There are most programs. Most programs that you use, you <laughs> this basically boils down to a couple of screens worth of code. And we'll walk through it, and, but we'll walk through it. We'll build it from scratch just to give you a feel what it's like to write a, to write a simple but playable game. using Python. And uh, actually, my first question is, how many of you have programmed in Python before? Anyone? Can you folks hear me? Yeah. Well, I can hear, I can hear you. <laughs> I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So anyways, all right, who here has not programmed in Python before? <laughs> me. I haven't. Okay. All right. Well. Okay. Well, we could play. We we can play around with it. All right. I guess the first thing to do is to make sure that everybody has installed Python on their uh, uh, on their computer. Now, um, if you haven't, let me share my screen again and point you to a place. Uh, I can point you to a place where you can install it from pretty quickly, and that place is. Let me. That place is here, anaconda.com. And let it, let's let it download. Come on. The web's being a bit slow for me today. Yeah, your audio is cutting out a bit sometimes. Okay, I'll keep an eye. I'll, I'll keep an eye on that. Yeah, my web is being slow today. But anyways, if you go to, there it is, if you go to anaconda.com, you can download Python there. Go to that site, click Get Started, and then click Download Anaconda Installers. Anaconda is a company that uh, distributes uh, a version of the Python programming language. And I do like, uh, I do like what they provide simply because it is a, um, they give you a nice complete package that you could use for uh, that you could use for all kinds of pro uh, Python programming, including data science. They include a lot of they include a lot of extras that you'd have to go hunt down and download yourself. It is it is it's a nice complete package if you want to get started programming Python, or if you need to if you're planning to do data science. There is a lot of they provide a lot of the packages that you need for data science or machine learning or artificial intelligence, which is fantastic. And it downloads pretty quickly. Basically, pick the installer that works for your particular operating system. Uh, I can help you if you're a little bit lost with that. Um, and uh, once it's downloaded, double click it. That'll fire up the installer and install Python on your computer. Let me know if you need a moment to, 
let me know if you need a moment to do that, uh, to go and install Python. And how do you... a couple of things set up here. And if anything I show on my screen is a little too small to read, let me know. I can stop. Okay. Uh, uh, by the way, has anybody not yet installed Python? I'm in that case. What I'm going to do is I'm going to press forward. Uh, let me show you really quickly. Uh, let me show you really quickly what uh, um, the quickest Python. The quickest Python program. Doesn't look like a game, but at least it will do something. I guess the other thing is, do um, have any of you, uh, have all of you downloaded some kind of uh, editor for your code, something like Visual, Stu uh, Visual Studio Code, something to type, uh, something to type code into? VI. Perfect. <laughs> old school. <laughs> Very old school. Classic. As long as you can, as long as you've got something that you can enter code in, uh, it's pretty straightforward. What I'm going to do is I'm going actually, to actually, sorry, actually, I was going to say I could probably do a next code too, but it actually, I can have a smaller window with VI. That's actually better, I think. Yeah. <laughs> actually, I'm going to quit. Yeah. Let me quit out of Xcode. I just don't want to muddy, I don't want to muddy here uh, create a new visual studio code window here and what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you the world's simplest python program just for those of you who've never played around with it before so i'm just going to create a new file and it's going to be very, very simple. Basically, I'm just going to simply a classic. Let me bump up the yeah, the, the classic. It's basically uh, I'm going to use the Python's built-in print function to print the uh, to basically display the uh, the phrase "Hello World" on the screen. I'm going to save it under the name. And you can pick what, wherever works on your uh, wherever works on your computer. I'm going to save it under the name hello.py. Py is the standard is the standard file name extension for Python files. Generally, once you've got Python installed on your computer, or and if you're using an if you're using a code editor that is aware of these file name extensions. file, and it will even color your text appropriately. So in this case, uh, what, what this is doing is it's highlighting the built-in function names in yellow and um, highlighting the text part here, hello world. 
in an orangey brown. And what I've done is I have sailed, I, I've saved the file name. I've saved the file under the name hello.py. And then what I can do is I can run. So for those of you who've installed Anaconda Python and are running Windows, if you go to the start menu, there's um, go to the start menu and look for the um, look for the Anaconda folder. And in there, there should be something like an Anaconda, an Anaconda command line interpreter or something like that. It should say Anaconda command line. I'm gonna uh, double check on my spider? Windows machine right now. Sorry? Uh, can I sure. use Spider? So, spider. Yeah. You... It's downloaded in the package. It's just, yeah, it's, I don't know, it reads better. Uh, okay. Sure. Yeah, whatever whatever editor you prefer okay. is fine. And to run it, basically, ah, there we go. To run it, if you're on Windows, um, yeah, open up the Start menu and look for uh, look for the Anaconda folder, and in there, look for Anaconda prompt. If you click on that, you'll get a command line. You'll get a command line window. That that is aware that uh, that is aware that your your machine has Python installed on it. If you're on a Mac, it should it should be readily available as soon as you open a, as soon as you open a terminal. And what I'm going to do is I am going to confirm that I'm in the directory with hello.py and I am right here. And I'm just going to type in Python followed by hello.py, basically saying Python, take the contents of a file, the file named hello.py and execute its contents, run it. And uh, I should try and bump up the size of the font here, but the output, it, it will output hello world. Let's see if I can, where is that font? There we go. Much better. Trying to make sure that my screen is readable. And let me know if any of you are not getting uh, that uh, that output after running the program. Hello. Thank you for making that text bigger. That's that's great. <laughs> Glad to help. I, I understand. And yeah. I, I am Especially not. Especially if you're viewing in a smaller window. All right. Let's see. Uh, are, what's, happen what's happening there? Um, I'm on a Mac and I have Python 3.9.1. And when I'm okay. in a terminal uh, window and I type mm -hmm. Python, it says Python 2.7 not recommended. And for me, I have uh, to type Python okay. 3. Um, Python 3? Yeah, that's what I have to type. It's in yes. user bin. Yes, yeah, because you've got two versions of Python. Yeah. OK. You've got two on your computer. Yeah, try typing in Python 3, where I'm typing in Python. OK. So, and that should work. And in fact, um, I'm going to do the same. It should, it should work for me. So I'm going to type in Python 3, hello.py. And yeah, it has the same effect. But yeah, if you've got two, yeah, it, it just sounds like you've got both ver both the old version and the new version. So you should type it. Is Python. it a capital P or? Nope, lower case. It still doesn't know what Python 3 is. It says Python 3 not defined. I, um, I have the, the, their IDE though, and I can run files from that, I think. All right, try, try that. Let's see what happens. Oh, okay. Uh oh. Okay. I, I guess something ran. 
what happened? Oh, I got to bring it back up again. And you know, if it helps, uh, if it helps, maybe you can share your screen. Uh, I think I've enabled that. If you go, it should be in your Zoom menu. Okay. <laughs> oh, you're gone. Oh, no, 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 I'm here. Oh, wait, this, my screen is gone. I'm here. My but, screen is uh, gone. Um, oh. I hear you, but I don't see, see anybody. <laughs> we oh, see you. No, it's probably because our faces are, yeah, our, when I stopped sharing my screen, the window with our faces was probably moved around somewhere. Do you see me? Um, yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah, because you're looking back and forth for the. You've, I take it you've got two screens. No, you've I have your, one your, screen. <laughs> oh, okay. Because you're. I'm just looking for. Because you're looking. Have, Zoom, have might, a, go ahead. Zoom might be in full screen mode. I have to switch between that and the other things I was working on by hitting Control Left or Right arrow. Ah, okay. She's on. Uh, she's on the Mac, though. Uh, Mac Me too. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is, it, is that there? I thought that was a Windows only thing. That arrow. Oh, snaps. so what I do, I'm running in um, I'm in side view where I've got the terminal in one one screen and the zoom in the other, and that's the full screen part. And then I can oh. control arrow over back to my other stuff on my desktop. Okay, but. Uh, yeah, Gene, if it's giving you trouble, uh, what I can do is I can walk you through the process of uh, install. Uh, what we can try and do is install a different version of Python that I think will take on your machine and listen to you and listen to you when it when you type in Python. Do you want to try that? Um, no, I don't want to slow people down. It's uh, it, it hardly it's hardly. Uh, a relatively simple program for this purpose just so we could all get just so we could all get set up is this this okay. happens all right so you want to want and me to everybody go to set up different yeah go to anaconda.com what i'm going to do is i'm oh, going to share my screen and oh there we go all right i saw i see you now so if you go to anaconda all right if you go to anaconda.com, you should see a screen that looks like uh, what I'm showing right now. And uh, the get started, uh, just click on the get started button. And you should have a list of options. And one of them, the very last one in the list here is download Anaconda installers. Okay. And then what you want to um... do is click on. Graphical installer um, or the command um, line installer? Go with the graphical installer. It's friendly. It, it's the, it's pretty much the same size anyways, but it's friendly. Yeah, it's a lot user friendly. Um, and I pro I program all day, and I use the graphical installer. Get started. Buy now. I don't want to buy anything. Individual. Uh, no, this, yeah, this. Uh, you can skip that, but yeah, this is the community edition. They uh, they make their money by they make their money by licensing to large corporations at uh, who knows how many hundred dollars oh. a seat. I, I guess it is downloading. Okay, but yes, for individuals, this is free. This is basically. This is this is basic. Yeah, this uh, the, companies like Anaconda make their money by uh, selling corporate licenses, and the idea is that uh, the idea is that what they want to do is they want to get programmers hooked on it so that they go to their managers and go, "Can we get the corporate version, please?" That ba basically, it's uh, it's a 
it's a sales strategy that uh, the Microsoft term at the time was uh, compute, uh, the consumerization of IT. So get um, it is basically the back, it, it is the backwards version of what happened in the 80s and 90s where the computer stuff you used at home was the computer was driven by what you used in the office. Nowadays, what you use in the office is driven by the stuff you use at home. It is no longer the IT department telling you what you're running. You are now telling the IT department, uh, I want to use the software. You have to make it happen. Where do I want to install this? Um, it should actually, you don't, uh, just on your hard drive, basically. It should, okay. it, should, it should install it in the right place on your operating system. Okay. Yeah. I think the only thing you have to do is just tell it, yeah, I want it on my hard drive. That's it. And the installer, the installer is smart enough to install it on the proper, in, in the proper place. Now, yeah, we need a version. We need we need a version of Python for you that's working on the command line because we need to use one command line to we need to use a command line tool once to download the Pygame package, and in the meantime. I am going to point you to a free book. And let's make sure it's actually, uh, yeah, it should be available here. And it's called Code the Classics and Yes, it is available for free if you buy, if you download the electronic version. And what Code the Classics does is it walks you through coding several classic arcade games that you write in Python and in Python using the Pygame library and it's actually meant um, it's actually meant for uh, it's meant for the Raspberry Pi, but it works just as well on uh, much larger, much larger computers, including your Mac and Windows machines. Um, and yeah, it, you will actually learn how to program. Uh, you'll learn all the secrets behind programming classic 80s arcade games, including, uh, I think you write your own version of Bubble Bobble, which is a classic, which is a classic from the 90s and which I lost dozens of quarters on. <laughs> at the arcade back when I don't even know if arcades exist anymore, but it was a lot of fun back then. I'm saying we're showing our age talking about our arcade memories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, did anybody see that uh, that news item about the uh, chunks of jet plane engine falling? On yeah. House yeah. It's the twenty. It's really weird timing because it's the twentieth anniversary of Donnie Darko. Donnie Darko. <laughs> like I'm going twenty years ago. Wait, that movie just happened. I like that movie. Oh yeah, it's favorites. Outer cool. Shutter Island. <laughs> hey, uh, Gene, has a uh, is it installed? Uh, just about done. That was a good sound. Yeah, that sounds like the that sounded like the installed sound. Okay. Okay, it's there. <laughs> okay. Well, the real test now is if you can go to the command line and navigate in the command line to the very to the folder or directory that you saved hello dot dot py in, and see if you can run it. So, yeah, go to that directory and then try Python. Python space hello.py. Syntax error. <laughs> Let's see now. I'm sharing my screen right now again. Okay. Now I see the error. Okay. That's good. 
But yeah, good old syntax error. Basically, that is the standard programming catch-all for I don't understand. I don't understand the. Uh, I don't understand what you what you just told me. But basically, what we're doing is, uh, yeah, in hello dot uh, hello dot py, we are using. Oh, hey, good. Yeah. <laughs> hello world. <laughs> okay, perfect. All right, and this is a good way to confirm that Python is installed and working on your computer. Now there is. We need to go to the command line again. And what we need to do is we need to install Pygame, and we're going to do it by using the Python. Um, there is something called, and let me see if I can uh, call it up on the browser here. Just want to talk about it here. Yeah, it's called pip. And if you do a search for it, the pip is short for Python installer of packages. So in other words, what it is, is it's a tool that allows us to uh, that allows us to bring in pack, um, bring in libraries of code that other people have already written so that we don't have to write it. The idea behind Python packages isn't all that different from Home Depot. When you want a new door for your house, you don't go to the woods to chop down a tree and whittle it down to a door. You go to Home Depot and you buy a pre-made door that is in a standard size and you know will and, and you know has the right uh, the right holes in it so you can put it in a doorknob and you can attach hinges to it because it's all, all that stuff has been taken care of for you pip is pretty much the same thing pip is home depot for python and what we're going to do is we're going to install the pygame package and it's really simple the command uh the command is pip pip all lowercase then space, then install, then space, and all lowercase again, pygame, P-Y-G-A-M-E. So we're basically telling, we're basically saying, hey, Pip, could you install the pygame package, please? And I'm gonna hit enter. Now, in my case, I already installed it. So Pip is basically telling me you already have it. That's what, that's what that response means, requirement already satisfied. For those of you who have not yet installed it, you should see a bunch of text, but afterwards you should see some kind of message indicating that it was successful. And the way you can confirm that you have it downloaded, the simplest way, of course, is to ask it to list all the packages, all the Python packages that have been installed on your system, and that you do with the command line pip list. And as you can see, in my particular case, I've installed some other packages to do some other work. There's a lot of pre-installed ones. And yes, that's the other thing. With Anaconda, there's a whole bunch of pre-installed stuff because they have, they figured, look, you're using this for, you're using this to get things done. We have, we have chosen what appears to be the most used or most useful. So um, if you wanna do a data, data science course, you're already, and you're using Anaconda, you're already covered because they have already, they have already pre-installed a lot of the packages that, uh, uh, that are used for data. That works really smoothly. Yeah, they know, they, they know what they're doing and they know that, uh, they know, they know that a lot of, uh, yeah, Python's used pretty heavily in data science. There's also a fantastic tool that they can, that, that uh, Anaconda pre-installs. If you go with Anaconda Python, it's called Jupyter Notebooks. It is a, uh, uh, you know, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic yet underappreciated piece of, so uh, piece of software. It lets you write live documents, live documents that mix narrative text and code together. The Nobel Prize, the winner for 2019's Nobel Prize in, or 2018's Nobel Prize in Economics, used it to write uh, to write their to write the essay. Is that like a light scribe, just, or is that the same implementation as I'm thinking of? 
not sure what light scribe is what is that uh i have adhd so there's whole lots of tools and stuff but it's basically a pen that while you're writing it records everything that you can hear while you do it no, so that can link not. information no not quite what it basically lets you do is it lets you write uh it lets you write it lets you write documents in markdown like uh, mm -hmm. mixed with code so what you can do is you write uh so the guy, the guy who won the Nobel Prize in economics wrote his essay, but also included the data that his essay was based on, plus the code that crunched that data to basically show his work. Okay, all right. So it's so it's imagine, like other ways of visualizing the information and applying whatever coding, yeah. or how it's applied. Okay, yeah, that's so, neat. Yeah, basically what it lets you do is it lets you write documents with actual live code in it. So you can kind of prove you you can you're you're basically submitting your proof along with your work. Uh, but it's it, it's useful for all kind it's useful for all kinds of things. And uh, it's yeah, it, basically they're incredibly rich documents. That's the best way to describe it. But uh, getting back to Pygame. If you type in pip list, you should get a giant list of all the packages that have been installed with your version of Python. And if you scroll through, all the packages are listed in alphabetical order. And under P near the end, there should be Pygame and it should show version 2.0.0. So this is the most recent version of Pygame. Pygame has gone, has undergone a, um, has undergone a, uh, a, a new version. So this is this is a new version with new features, but a lot of old uh, a lot of old programs running in Py that use Pygame will also work as well. And it must be special. I have 2.0.1. Oh hey, okay. So they've updated they have updated it very recently. So you've got the new you've got the newest version. Pro they probably fixed a bug. We're probably not likely to run into it, into it but it's yeah. good we've got the latest version. All right. Well, hey, it's time to actually write our first pie game program. What we're going to do is we're going to draw a blank screen because that blank screen is going to be the canvas for our game. So what I want, what I want you to do is create a new file and um, save it right now. I'm going to call it uh, game-1.py, whatever works for you. We're going to be writing several versions of it. We're, we're, we're going to start with a program and just keep adding on to it. So I'm just going to save, pick, and, pick a name that you want to save the game under and save it. And by saving it with the .py file name extension, your editor will likely realize, hey, this is a Python file. I will color I will color keywords and other things appropriately. So the first thing I want to do, the first thing we want to do in our program is we want to say we want to use the Pygame library. Once again, Pygame is a whole bunch of code that's already been written that we can take advantage of. It does, uh, Pygame comes with utilities for drawing things on screen, moving images around the screen, and playing sounds. And we're going to take advantage of all that. So the first thing we need to do is we need to tell Python that we want to use Pygame. And we do that by saying import Pygame. We want to import the Pygame library into our own program. That's the general idea behind it. Once we have this statement inside our program, the entirety of the Pygame library, which includes all the, all the visual and sound stuff, becomes available to us. So that's the first step. Now we have access to the Pygame library and all its goodies. The next thing we want to do is we want to define a couple of constants. So basically, these are uh, these are basically containers for numbers that we want to keep uh, that that we're going to make use of com fairly constantly. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark them off with a comment. 
A comment does a comment is basically a little note for the programmer. It does not affect how the program works at all. This is for the benefit of you. It's kind of a trail of, it's basically a little post-it note in code telling you, oh yeah, this is what this particular thing does. Comments in Python begin with this symbol here. Some people call it a number sign. Some people call it a hash mark. Uh, certain curm curmudgeons like to refer to it as an octothorpe but basically it's the number sign, the hash mark. And it basically says that everything after this line is a comment, does not affect how the code works. Once again, it is only for the benefit of the programmer, you. And we're going to define a couple of constants. And this is a Python, well, this is, this is a convention in, pro, in a lot of programming languages, constants, where constants are spelled out in all caps. It's just kind of a reminder that this is something that we're not really expecting to change once it's been defined. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna define a game area. We're gonna call it the game, the game screen. We're gonna say it's gonna be 800 pixels wide by 600 pixels high. That should fit comfortably in on most computer and laptop screens. So I'm gonna say, that we're going to define a constant called screen width, and it will be 800, set e equal to 800. And we're going to use another constant called screen height. And we're going to call it 600. So in the end, what we're going to do is we're going to, the game will play inside a window that is 800 pixels wide, 600 pixels high. So that's a, that's a standard four by three ratio and should take up three quarters ish of most screens. Probably more actually, screens are higher resolution, but this is guaranteed to run on just about every computer. The last thing we're going to do, the last constant we're gonna specify is basically frames per second. And basically, we're just telling the game, we're telling the game, look, try to try to update the screen this many times per second. And we're gonna go, we're gonna go for 60. That should give us nice smooth animation. Even a computer that is for this particular game, even a computer that's 10 years old should be able to keep up. Uh, we're not, we're not doing that. We're, we're not doing the fanciest of graphics right now. And 60 frames per second is very, very smooth. I mean, as reference, uh, film is up to, film is 24 frames per second, and TV is a tiny fraction shy of 30 frames per second. So this is going to be, this is supposed to be fairly smooth. I'm, I'm not seeing your screen. Oh, okay. Let me make sure I'm sharing the right one. We can see your screen, or at oh, least okay. I can. Yeah, I can, I can see it. Uh, it's my Zoom window, uh, yeah. Try and call up Zoom and see where the, your, the, your Zoom window is, where I've, got the, where I've got the screen sharing. Can you see our faces, or? I see you, I see your faces along the side. Okay, yeah, in the, right. yeah, in the box, there should be another window containing the shared screen. Let me know if you're having any trouble. I don't know what happened to it. What you may want to do is, yeah, if you're on a Mac, uh, yeah, go to the dock and click on Zoom. Go to what? Uh, do the dock, basically the little bunch of I program icons in the bottom of the screen. Oh. Yeah, that's the dock. And if you click on the Zoom icon, blue, blue square with a okay. white. Okay, I see you. Symbol. I see it now. There we go. All right. Okay. But yeah, so we've got import pie game at the top. And then the next few lines are, ba we're basically defining a couple of constants. We need to define one more constant, uh, one more constant at the very least. And I'm gonna type it in right now. Basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define uh, 
this, a set of three numbers that defines a specific color. In this case, we're going to define black. And these three number, okay, these three numbers inside parentheses, that's called, um, that's called the tuple. Basically, it's an ordered set of numbers. And each of these numbers represents different color intensities for the three colors that screens use to draw any color, red, green, and blue. So basically, what I'm, what I'm saying is that the color black is made up of zero intensity red, zero intensity red light, zero intensity green light and zero intensity blue light. So in other words, a complete absence of light. That defines the color black. We're going to use it to draw the, uh, we're gonna color the, the screen that color. Is, um, in Python, is that a percentage? Just wondering. Uh, it is a, no, this is a number between zero and 255. Oh, okay. Okay, so we've got these, we've got, we've got our constants defined. This is everything we need to run, to get a basic Pi game program, to set up a basic Pi game program. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another comment here just to mark out that we're going to do is we're going to initialize Pi game. So basically this is, this, once again, this comment is for the benefit of the programmer. So you remember later on when you look at this code tomorrow or next week or next month, exactly what it is you did. And the first thing we need to do is we're basically saying, hey, Pygame, we need you to initialize yourself. That's what this does. And I'm going to add a comment here at the end, just as a reminder. What Pygame does is it starts up Pygame. Oh, I didn't know you could add comments uh, on the same line. Yep, you can. Basically, you, oh, sorry. oh, sorry. Uh, but but basically, I was going to say anything to the right of anything to the right of the uh, of the number sign um, is ignored by the compiler. So you can't put comments at the start of a line because that makes the entire line a comment. That but you can put it at the end of a line. the hash just cuts off anything past it. And then what I'm going to do, yep. What I'm also going to do, we're not going to use it immediately, but we will need it later, is we're going to say start pygame.mixer.init. And what we're telling pygame here is it starts, uh, I don't want to put a space there, it's just neater. Basically, it starts a Pi Game sound mixer. Pi Game is capable of playing several sounds at the same time, so you can play sound effects while having a soundtrack play continuously in the background, which is what good games generally do. Pi Game is taking care of that for you. This used to be a really big pain to program. Now, now Pi Game is doing most of the work. You're basically saying, "Oh yeah, play the sound." Hey, Pi Game, here's the file. Play the sound which is nice. So that initializes Pi game. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to set up the screen. And we do this by creating a variable named screen. And we call on some built-in stuff in the Pi game. Pi, Pi game has a function built into it called display, or an object in it called display. And inside it, there is a function called set mode. Basically, we're just saying, look, I want, I need a screen of 
oops, there we go, screen width and screen height. Notice there, there are double parentheses here because the inside of parentheses just keeps these two groups, it expects an ordered pair inside parentheses. Basically, we're just saying, look, I need a screen of this width and this height. And that is the window, that is the game window. So setting mode basically defines the, set mode basically defines the game screen's dimensions. What we'll also do is um, the game screen appears inside a window. What we're gonna do is we're gonna give the window a type. And we do that using the built-in set caption command. And you can use whatever, and you can give the game whatever name you like. It's basically just whatever, it's displayed in the window, in the bar at the top of the game window. So when I run my, when, when, I, when we run it, when I run mine, it's gonna say my game on top of, in the window bar, the window at the very top. All right, and what we have done now is we've written all the necessary code to actually get Pygame Pi game set up. It's now time for the main part of the program. And, um, and the main part of most games is something called an event loop. And all an event loop is, is, is just something that the game that the game software does over and over and over again. And in this case, what it's doing is if the event loop is basically just this repeating process where the game is checking to see if anything's changed. Has, has, the, player, has the player pressed the key? Or has, has one of the objects on the screen run into another object on the screen? And then based on that, react to that, update the screen, and then go back and listen for more events. Has the, has the player pressed another key? Has some other object bumped into some other object? And then respond to that, and then go back, listen for another, listen for more events. That's basically the idea behind the event loop. And actually, that's not all that different from what your, the operating system on your computer is doing all the time. It is going through its own event loop. It is listening, uh, it is looking for events on your keyboard. Have you, have you pressed the key? Have you moved the mouse? Has a signal come in from the internet? And then it responds appropriately, and then it switches back. It loops back to looking for more events that have happened and then responding appropriately. That's why it's called an event loop. It's listening or looking for events and then responding accordingly. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now. So we're gonna write a quick little program we're going to write a little, quick little program that runs a game event loop. So I'm going to mark this as the event loop. So that's that's what I'm marking with a comment here. And I'm going to create a little variable called running. I'm going to set it to true and then Python true and false begin with capital T or capital F. And the running variable, the running variable uh, basically, basically just tells the event loop to keep going if it's set to true. If the running variable is set to false, it's basically a signal to the event loop to quit, to quit the game. And we will come up with conditions for why the game should end. So what I'm gonna do is I'm now going to write a loop, and this is a Python while loop. Basically, what it's saying is that do it, what's what it's saying is do the code below this line as long as running is set as long as the value inside running 
is true. That's what while running colon means. And everything that is indented in everything underneath while running that is indented will be executed in will be executed over and over again as long as running is true. This is where the loop is. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to tell Pygame to update, update the game's internal clock. And remember, uh, we were, we were specifying earlier that we want to we want the game to run at 60, 60 frames a second. So that's what we're we're going to tell Pygame just that. Um. Does the clock tick also control how fast the event loop repeats? Yes. Okay. So everything happens at the speed. Yeah, everything happens at the speed of clock tick. So what we're basically telling, what we're telling by game is try to keep, try to keep things running at 60 frames a second. And we do that at the start. We do that at the start of each loop. So every time it goes through the cycle, and ideally it will do this 60 times a second, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to make sure it's going to synchronize the clock so that it is running at 60 frames a second and do the necessary thing. And it will automatically behind the scenes do everything necessary to keep your game running at 60 frames a second. So that you have that nice, crisp, clean animation. And um, for a program this simple, this should not, like I said, this should not be a problem for just about anybody's computers out there. What we're going to do, and we're not going to use very much, uh, much of this sec segment yet, but basically, this is the part where we handle events. Once again, this is why this is called the event loop. We have an event happen, and then we respond to it accordingly. And in this case, what we want to do is we just want to check we just want to make sure, we, we want to check where the user has quit the program. And if the user has entered a command to quit the program, we want to actually quit the program gracefully. And the way we do it is, I'm going to use a for loop here. I'll explain what I'm doing, what this code actually does in a moment. This was the hardest thing for me to learn, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it takes a little getting used to. But basically what we're doing is we're going, look, there's this giant list of possible events that could happen. And I want, and we're saying, hey, Python, go through, go through that entire list. That's what, the, that's, what, that's what this statement does right here. Go through every list. There's a giant list stored in this, that's provided by this function, pygame.event.get. There's an event. This retrieves all the possible events that could happen right now. Go through them one by one. And every time you go through all those events, the current event that you're looking at, looking at right now, we're going to call event. So is each event its own separate function? Each event is its own happening. So one of them is going to be a key press. Oh, okay. Another might be the mouse moving. Okay. And one we're looking for actually is. But these aren't defined yet. Sorry, I'm, I don't. No, mean to they're built, no, they're all built. They're, these are all built-in events. Oh, okay, okay. That's one so thing. That's gonna, yeah. So we're going to check for a specific kind of event. And that is, you know, check to see if the user has closed the window. or hit, uh, hit control or command C on the command line. So in other words, has the user quit the program? And in fact, I'm just, oops. And these are all comments, once again. So that's what, the, and these comments are just there to explain what this line is. Basically, we're going, look. 
And pi game has some built-in constants as well. That's why this is in all caps. Because this is a constant. This is a number representing the event where the user has quit the game. Oops. There we go. So if the user has quit the game, and the way they can do that is either by clicking on the uh, close window button, or they go to the command line and hit control. Uh, actually, it should just be control C, not command C. My mistake. Yeah, if they hit control C on the command line, that also quits the program. Basically, if that happens, set the variable running false. And the next time you go to the start of a loop, running will no longer be true and will exit the loop and execute whatever command comes after this loop. So that's the general idea. We are just checking to see, and right now just checking the events to see, has the user quit the program? And that's it. And if so, we'll set running to false and we will exit the event loop and we should, we'll be able to get out of the game after that. And the next part, the next part is actually where we just draw stuff on screen. What we're going to do is we define that screen earlier. We, uh, and basically it is, we defined it here and we said, look, if we want a window that is screen width pixels wide and screen height pixels high. And at this point, we're basically saying, look, we want, we just want this big black uh -huh. rectangle there. Oh, never mind. I found what I did wrong. Oh, okay. There's one more thing we need to do, and that is what happens when, and this happens behind the scenes on your computer. What generally happens is when you're drawing stuff on the screen, you're actually drawing stuff to a big block of your computer's RAM somewhere. So there's a dedicated area of your computer's RAM, your computer memory, where you draw, where you draw character, where you draw objects onto. Basically, you're filling it up with numbers. And then what you do is you tell the computer, okay, this big area of memory, I want you to now display it on screen. So that's what we're going to do right now. We have, and we do that by going by using this command. So pygame display dot flip. So everything we've done up to this point, screen dot fill black, is just writing stuff to memory. It is this command right here, pygame dot display dot flip, that takes, that basically says, look, okay, now that I've written all this graphic stuff to memory, I want this memory, I want to transfer this memory to the screen. And that's basically what's happened. And that's, that's what makes that part of the game visible. This up here, everything's indented. That's because everything indented is part of the loop that starts with while running. But for the next line, I don't want it indented. This is not part of the loop. This comes after the loop. This is executed when the loop, when we exit the loop. And basically what we're doing is we're telling Pi game to quit. Most of the time when the game is running, we're just going to stay inside this loop and do this over and over again. Check for events, respond accordingly, draw the results of the screen. Check events, respond accordingly, draw the results of the screen over and over and over again. That is basically what video games are. Check for something happening, respond, <laughs> respond appropriately, draw the results of the screen. At this point, I'm going to save. I'm gonna to go to the command Joey, line. can I ask a stupid question? There are no stupid questions, go ahead. Good. Okay, can I ask a question? So in yeah. Python, does it just 
determine the end of the while loop by the indentation? Yes, that is it. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Did you have to manually backspace to drop the indentation? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, to, oh, in this case, yeah. Uh, when, yeah I, most when you editors, hit, when you hit uh, yeah, draw when I hit, stuff hit, on the screen. Oh uh, no! This is also in. This is still indented. That's Basically, part of the four, but uh, most uh, editors. Oh, here, yes. After false, because there's an indentation after the if statement. Yeah, I had to backspace. Okay, okay. Because generally the editor will go. Yeah, the editor. Yeah, generally the editor will assume. Oh, you're indented this much. I'm assuming your next line will be at the same level. Gotcha. So, uh, yeah, when you need to, yeah, when you need to unindent or what they sometimes call outdent, yeah, use just use backspace. But the idea is that in Python, the, uh, the idea is that anything indented means that it belongs to the thing above it. So in this case, this entire block of code here is indented under while running. So this is the loop that belongs to while running. This, all this code gets executed over and over again as long as the variable running contains the value true. Gotcha. Yeah. All better now. So make sure that, yeah, glad to help. So make sure that uh, pygame.quit, this state, this line right here, is not indented. We want it only to be executed if we leave the while running loop. Once again, I'm going to save the file. I'm going to go to the command line. I am going to utter the magic phrase, this should work, and try run the program. I'm going to try running the program. So in this case, since my file is called game-1.py, I'm going to type in Python game-1py. Oh, what's he doing on the I forgot one variable here. Let me fix that. Under initialize pi game. I forgot to set the var the variable name clock. And basically, I'm just going, look, uh, Pi game, could you give me a clock object, please? There we go. So put it, make it the last line of the initialize Pi game section, section of code. Basically, what we're doing is we're saying, look, I need a, I need an object, I need one of Pi game's built-in objects. It's the clock. It's the little thing that keep, it, it's the thing that keeps the game running at a constant speed. And if I run the program now, I should get this. Not terribly exciting, but it is a start. Notice it's a window, and it does have whatever name you decided to display in the window title bar. And as requested, we did get a completely black uh, game playing field. And if I, and notice right now in, in my command line, as soon as I ran the program, I got a little message from Pygame, hello from the Pygame community. And then the cursor is just hanging there. It's going to stay there as long as the game window is active. And as soon as I cl close the game window, it means the program is done and it will quit. And that is exactly the event that we were watching for here. Did I close the window? And if so, set the variable running to false. And the next time it goes to the start of a loop, running is no longer true. So we exit the loop and it executes this line of code, pygame.quit, which means it cleans up all memory, stops running the program and gives control back to 
and gets controlled back to your operating system. Can you scroll up to line 13, please? Yeah, sure. Here we go. How's that? Ah, minus sign. Yeah. Okay, let me try that again. Yeah, give it a try. Well, I finally got the, uh, I apologize, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, please. Uh, well, okay. So we finally got uh, the um, Anaconda installed and also uh, Visual Studio. And we've been following along um, doing all of the code here. Uh, but for some reason, mm -hmm. when I run it, the Anaconda um, window it is not recognizing. Um, it says uh, Python can't open file, uh, the name of our file. No such file or directory um, is not recognized as an internal or external command. Um, uh, let's see now. Um, so are, are you in the Anaconda command prompt? I'm Actually, sorry? Well, are, you in win uh, are you running Windows or Mac? Windows. OK, Windows. So. What you want to do is you want to be typing in, yeah, the command to run the program, you want to be typing in from the Anaconda command prompt. So if you go to the start menu, so the little way, you go to the Windows icon, lower left-hand corner of the screen. Right. Right. And then uh, one of the, yeah, one of the options under A should be a folder marked uh, Anaconda 3 or something like that. Okay, yeah. And if you click on that, You'll have a whole bunch of options, and one of them is Anaconda Prompt. Anaconda Prompt. Okay, I have that open. Okay, so all right. So yeah, that's where you type your commands in. So if you're there, then the thing is you need to go to you need to go to the directory where you save uh, you, where you save your code, your game 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 dash one py or whatever you saved it under. Oh, okay. All right. Um, and you can see if you're in, in the right directory, if you type in DIR for directory, it should list a whole bunch of files and see if your file, see if it's listing your file there. Okay. Um, it's saying I have no init member, quit member. On. Does it specify which line? Uh, 11, but that might be 13. Let me see. Okay, yeah, on so 11, you... on 11, and then it says one. So Pygame game dot in it. No, that's pretty straightforward. Yeah, I have that exactly as you do. And in, and then parentheses after it? Yep. After it? Yeah. Hmm. Nothing's put in the uh, middle of it. Do you have import pie game at the very top? Yes, sir. Like the very first line. Yeah. Hmm. And then what's the error message you're getting? Uh, it says module pie game has no init member. Uh, it says pylint no member in parentheses. Oh, wow. Um, and then it says pie game has no quit member, no member. She might be getting the same issue. Or wait, I don't know if she was using the same one. Uh, that is odd. That no, that because that's been, yeah. No, those functions should be are, are built into Pygame. That's how it works. Um, yeah, that, that's what I assumed because I'm calling yeah. on it. Uh, could you share your screen? Yeah. Uh, Take a look. I'll stop sharing mine. And uh, the control. Yeah. It should appear at the bottom of your Zoom, almost dead center of your Zoom window. I need to move this bar just a second. All right, and sure, go for it. Okay, it might get really choppy. That's okay. So yeah, import Pygame, right? I'm looking at it, Pygame. And it's, huh. Yeah, right here, here are my errors. Have you, uh, 
Hmm, that's odd. But uh, you know what? Try try running it from uh, the uh, Anaconda prompt rather than inside Visual Studio. If Visual Studio code is not is configured not to use Py, uh, can you see the screen or just the program? Uh, both. I can see your uh, PowerShell. Yeah, I can see your PowerShell prompt and your uh, and your code. So yeah, it, it launches and immediately closes. Uh, you Python. can't see it on my other screen. Oh, oh okay. Python game one pi. Yep. Oh, there we go. There okay. Go. Uh, big dumb me. Thank you. No, no problem. That's this guy. This comes with practice. How about everybody else? Is any is anybody else still uh, not getting that that big blank window? Yeah, I'm still not not finding my file. Okay. Uh, do you know where you? Uh, let's see. Where are you? I'm trying to think of where. Uh, what do you have the game file saved as? Because I messed up because uh, I misspelled mine. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I I had um, Jaden and Mammy's game. And so there's an apostrophe in there. Would that cause an issue? That might cause an issue. Try and uh, remove, yeah, try and save it without the apostrophe. All righty. Ow, man, my leg's cramped. Right. And then, of course, it's a matter of where, yeah. And we can figure out, we, we can figure out where you've saved your file. And we can come up with a couple of, we can come up with a couple of quick workarounds. Hmm. How's it going? Yeah, I'm not seeing the file. I'm actually not seeing any files in that folder where I saved it to. So maybe I'm just looking in the wrong place. Um, what you may want to try and do is, um, if you're using Visual Studio Code, under the file menu, pick Save As, because what that will do is it'll it'll show you uh, it'll show you a dialog box asking you, know, right. you want to save the file. And then you can figure out from that where, which directory, uh, which folder you've saved it in. So for instance, in fact, let me do that on my, uh, I'll do on the Windows machine here, can I see? So what I did was I saved it in this PC to documents, uh, but then when I opened up the, um, when I looked at the directory, um, it was under users, James document. So I'm assuming that that's the user we're logged into. Okay, so you should, uh, from the prompt, try, uh, try changing directories to documents. So type in CD space documents. And that should take you to the documents directory. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we're already in the documents directory. Oh, all right. Try type, uh, try typing dir and see if uh, if the file name appears in that list that 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 pops up. Yeah, and it says zero files, which is very strange. So. Let's see, what's the, uh, trying to think of a quick way to. Maybe I should I, save it in a different place. Yeah, I have an idea. Try save it, try saving it to desktop. Okay. That's probably the simplest way. So yeah, in yeah, in your code editor, whatever what code editor you're using, try saving it to the desktop, and then okay. 
and then we need to move you up one direct. And then in the command prompt, let's move you up one directory. And the way you do that is by typing in CD space period period. Period period means up one directory. Okay. And then let me know which directory. Yeah, your prompt should be the prompt should be telling you which directory you're in. You should be in C colon. Then, users. Okay, I'm in user James. Okay. And now. Now type in CD desktop. CD desktop. Oh, it's not cool. finding the path, which is strange because I'm not seeing the desktop in the list when I typed in the directory. Oh wow! So you're in. So are you in C users James right now? Yes. Desktop okay. is a capital D, I think. Uh, yeah, Windows isn't fussy about. Uh, oh, Windows. Never mind. Never mind. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, Windows isn't fussy about case, but uh, you're not. Um, if you type in, if you are in users James and you type in dir, do you is desktop not one of the things that appears? It's not. So maybe I need to back out all the way to just the C drive. A little too high up. Um, and are you, is there another user on the system as well? Like, Yes, there is another user, although James is the user that I'm logged in as. Okay, as yeah, I'm sure. Look. yeah, it should be there. Like if you're under C users, James, you should, you when you type in DIR, you should see contact, desktop, documents, downloads. Yeah, I see contacts. I see documents, downloads, favorites, links, music. But not desktop. <laughs> <Wonder. laughs> but no desktop. It's very strange. How did that happen? Okay, that's okay. A, yeah. Because I'm looking. Yeah, I'm looking at my other computer, my Windows computer, and yeah, it should, there should be de between contacts and documents. There should be a directory called desktop. Huh. Look, 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 look. People use me desktop. desktop, desktop. Okay, well, I, I backed out of James and I'm in just users. And now I see default user 10000.desktop, default user 10001.desktop. Ah. Okay, I'll just try saving it somewhere else. Yeah, try saving it to uh, Jane. Uh... To document, yeah. Try and save it to the documents directory. That should that should be under. That probably will appear under James. Like in Visual Studio, try and save it to documents and see what happens. But yeah, I am. I'm prepared to walk through people through just about any operating system. I have a Linux machine behind me and. A Mac to my left and a Windows machine to my right, <laughs> and even a Raspberry Pi in for emergencies. But yeah, I'm ready. Yeah, I'm basically ready to walk programmers through. Okay. Any I, luck? I don't know. I to, yeah, I had to go about a roundabout way to find the C users James documents files. Uh, let's see if this works this way. Okay. Yeah, so that one by Python followed by the name of the file. And once again, I'm gonna share my screen. Oh, okay. We see it. Yes. Good. There we go. So once again, uh, I'm gonna demonstrate again. If you type in Python followed by the file name, you should see. In the command line, you should see a text line that says hello from the Pygame community. That is just a little message that Pygame always displays when you run a Pygame application. And you should see a window somewhere, which is completely blank with a black background and a title bar that says my game. And that's it. Okay. Let's move to the next step. And that is we're going to draw something on screen. We're going to keep it simple for now and we're going to make it fancier and fancier. 
But what we need to do is we need to define just one more color. And that is, so I'm going back to the file now. And under the line where I define the color, the three, three red, green, blue values that define the color black, I'm going to define another constant called green. Once again, these numbers are on a scale from zero to 255, where zero is no light intensity, 255 is maximum intensity. And these colors are, these colors are made by mixing in order red, green, and blue. So zero, 255, and zero means no red intensity, full green intensity, no blue intensity. So what this does is this defines is a very, very green color. And we're going to use it in a moment. Because what we're going to do immediately after we've defined the colors is we are going to define a class. Now, for those of you who've never done object-oriented programming, it's really simple. A class is just a blueprint on which we can create many copies of an object. And, a and an object is just basically a bunch of code, a bunch of code and data in one package. And what we're going to do is we are going to define an object. We're going to define a class, which is a blueprint for an object. And this object is going to uh, represent the player on screen. And what I'm saying here is that this class is going to this class is going to inherit or basically borrow all the capabilities of a predefined class called sprite and the sprite is basically just a movable is a movable block of pixels basically a graphic object on the screen that we can draw all at once and move around. That's what a, the video game term is, a sprite. So if you've ever played Mario Brothers, Mario is a sprite. Luigi is a sprite. The mystery boxes are sprites. The mushrooms are sprites. The turtles are sprites. Sprites are basically the move, movable, uh, movable graphic objects on the screen. What we are doing is we are defining a player, which is a a player class, and the player is a kind of sprite. The player is a sprite. And then what we're going to do is we're going to define, uh, we're going to define a couple of bits of code inside the class that specify what the player looks like and how it behaves. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to use, we're going to write a function here called init, and the def keyword in Python is used to define that's why it's called def, def for define, to define a function. And the first function we're going to call define is a function called two underscores init, short for initialize, two underscores. It's uh, names that begin and end with two underscores are special built-in functions. This is basically a function that gets called whenever we create a new object based on the player class. So we're basically going, this is a set up. This is a setup function. This sets up the player sprite. And the first thing we need to do is we need to initialize the class that we are borrowing all this code from. So this is we're, we are telling the sprite class to set itself up. And that's what this that's what this long bit of gobbledygook is basically saying. We're just saying, look. The sprite, uh, hey, sprite class inside the Pygame library, set yourself up. We're going to use you. That's what this does. That's basically all we're doing. If we're saying, look, all that code that we're borrowing right now, all that, um, all that built-in sprite stuff that I don't have to write, set yourself up. I'm about to use you. The built-in word self basically means this particular object. So in this case, self refers to the player object. And we're just basically saying, look, uh, 
we want to set its image property. We want to say, look, I want to create, I want to create a, um, this sprite is going to be a 50 by 50 square. And we're going to draw something inside this 50 pixel by 50 pixel square. And that's what I'm doing right here. I'm basically saying, look, I need a graphic surface or basically an area of the screen that is 50 pixels wide and 50 pixels high. That's what I'm saying right here. This is where I'm, uh, this is the area that I'm going to draw something in. Why are there double sets of parentheses? Ah, okay, because this is at, um, the outer parentheses is, represents the stuff, the arguments that we're going to give to the function. The, the inner inside parentheses is tumble. because we're giving it an ordered pair. Oh. And so these, uh, these, these two numbers are actually part of one unit, which is why we, which is why we have them in their own set of parentheses. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's an ordered pair. It's an, it's an X and Y coordinate. So yeah, we have to get and, and we have to give it all to we have to give it to the surface function all in one unit. So that's why it's that's why it's in, in its own sense set of parentheses. And then we're basically saying, look, that 50 pixel by 50 pixel square, I want you to fill it with a color green. Then what I need to do is I need to I just need to define the rectangular area represented uh, defining the sprite. So I do that by going once again self means I'm referring to this particular object that the sprite that represents the player. And I'm going look, I want you to I want you to calculate the rectangular area that holds this. Uh, that holds this image, that 50 by 50 green square, and I want you to stick it in a variable because we're going to use it in a moment. And then finally, I just want to say, look, and this is going to be a green square, 50 pixels each side. And I'm basically saying, and I want you to treat the center as actually the dead center of that square. So basically, which means halfway across its width and halfway across its height is its center. I want you to treat that as the, I want you to treat the center of the square as the exact math, geogra uh, geometric center of the square, right down the middle. And that's it. This entire, these five lines of code set up set up what we are going to use to represent the player right now, which is a green square. And that is the first part. So whenever we create the player object, this init method will get called automatically. That's basically, it's because init is short for initialize. When we create the object, this initialize function gets called automatically and it does all this setup work. It creates it, it creates a bit of memory to represent the sprite, the thing we're going to draw on screen. It sets up a 50 by 50 pixel area. It fills it with the color green and then we calculate its dimensions so that we can accurately draw it on screen. And that's all we need to do to do the setup. We need to define one more function inside the player class, and that is what it should do on a regular basis. Basically, what happens when we update the screen? So that's what this function does. This gets called every time the player sprite is told to update itself on screen. And what we're going to do is we're going to, for now, we're going to just say, look, just keep moving, keep moving right across the screen. And the way we tell a sprite to move right is we just change its, 
we change the coordinates of its rectangles. So I'm just going to say self dot rect. Basically, what I'm saying the rectangle of, yeah, this sprite's rectangle and its x coordinates. is its x coordinates plus five. So in other words, move it five pixels over. If x is zero after this line of code, uh, the, this, uh, this sprite's x coordinates will be five over, five to the right. And what I'm also going to do is I'm going to say, look. And once it gets to once it gets past the right edge of the screen, uh, I want to I want to make it wrap around to the left edge of the screen. And we do that by simply saying, look, if if its left if its left edge is greater than the width of the screen, it means it's gone off the it's gone off the right edge of the screen. And in that case, what we want to do is tell you what, bring it to put its right edge at zero, basically at the left edge of the screen. So yeah, keep moving right until you move off the screen, then go, then reappear on the left side of the screen. That's what we're that's what we're telling the that's what we're telling the player player sprite to do. So notice. This entire class here is kind of self-contained. The player object on screen knows what to do. It has, a, it has its own set of instructions. Keep moving right. Keep moving right. Or, you know, if you've seen Finding Nemo, just keep swimming, just keep swimming. And if you've gone off the right edge of the screen, reappear on the left edge of the screen. That's all we're saying here. So I'll give you a couple, I'll give you a moment to type that all in. Have to do just a tiny bit more setup, but then we'll actually be able to see this thing in action. Oh, you know what? I made a mistake here. On my line 17, it's the one where we say self.rec.center. It should be screen width divided by two, screen height time divided by two. Basically, we want to start. We want to start in the dead center of the screen. That's what this does. This is basically saying the initial, the initial location of our player. Uh, of our player character, which right now is a plain green square. For those of you who remember the Atari 2600, that's as fancy as the graphics got back then. Well, you're showing your age again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I had one too, so whatever. <laughs> exactly. yeah. Uh, if you wanted it to appear in like the top left of the screen, um, how would you go about writing that? It would be screen.rec.center equals, and then inside parentheses, zero comma zero. Oh, and that would be? Yeah, because zero, zero, zero is the upper left-hand corner of the gotcha. screen. Gotcha. So, yeah. Okay. All right. I yeah. thought, thought I... X increases, X increases going right, and Y increases going down. Now, would that be the center of the rectangle, or would that be based off of if the rectangle has to be in the screen? Uh, in this case, actually, that would be the center of the rectangle. Uh, what you might. Uh, oh, zero, I, zero. Yeah, for zero, zero, what I would do would be I would actually set, set if I wanted the square flush against the upper, uh, right. upper, upper left corner. What I would do is I might actually write it as two lines. I would set it to self dot rec dot left equals zero, and self dot rec dot top equals zero. And, and that, then you'd 
define it there? Yeah, that would start. That means that the starting position of the square would actually be flush against the upper left hand corner. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we have actually given the player sprite all the information, all the code it needs to do its thing by itself. We now just need to set set up the rest of the game to take advantage of the player of the player sprite. So what I'm going to do is. It's immediately after the pi initialized Pi game section, but before the event loop. So I'm going to add a couple of blank lines here. So it should be just after the line where we define the clock. And what I'm going to do is I need to create, and, and this is this is where we're going to use something called a sprite group. And what a sprite group lets us do is it lets us it lets us address more than one sprite. It lets us address a group of sprites and we can divide them into different groups so we can have them do different things and receive different messages. And typically in Pygame, we at least define one group of sprites that represents everything on the screen. By tradition, it's, it's more of a convention. It's not a hard and fast rule. It's not, it's not built into the program. We call it all sprites. We, we, we call we give the group a name called all sprites or something like that. Something that makes very clear that this is a group of sprites that we can send a message to and address all the sprites all at once. And we do that by creating creating a sprite group and we give it the name all sprites. What I'm doing right now is I'm saying I want to create an actual object based on the player class. So capital P player is the blueprint. Lowercase p player is the player object itself. So basically I'm saying lowercase player is a sprite using uppercase p player, capital P player, as its blueprint. So it's this lowercase player that is actually the object in memory that represents the player that we're going to draw on screen. And the final thing I need to do is I need to go look. Well, I need to add player, lowercase p player, to the all sprites group. By doing that, what happens is any message I send to all sprites, the group, Get sent to any member of all sprites the group, which right now just contains player. So any message I send to all sprites will get sent to player. And that's all we need to do inside outside the event loop. We now need to do just a couple of things inside the event loop and we'll have something go. And then we'll have then we'll have something run. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go inside the event loop. And I need to do something just after we check for events, but just before we draw things on screen. This is the time to do it. Basically, what we're doing is we're updating stuff inside the game. The game state basically kind of describes the current conditions inside the game. And at this point, what I'm doing is I'm telling all sprites to update. So all, all sprites dot update. And then don't forget the parentheses at the end. What that basically means is that any any sprite that is a member of the all sprites group is told to update, gets the update message. And if you remember, inside player, we defined a function called update. So this is, so player, which is inside the all sprites group, gets this message and goes, oh, I had better, I just got the, I'm a member of all sprites and all sprites just got the update message. So I had better run my update function right here. 
And the update function is move myself five pixels to the right. And if I've gone off the right edge of the screen, bring myself back to the left edge. So that's what we've done right here. We have ba we're, we're basically telling any sprite inside the all sprites group, which right now only contains the player, to update itself. And since the player's update method causes it to move pi five pixels to the right, that's what it does. There's only one more thing we need to do, and it is in the draw stuff on screen portion of the event loop. We just need to add one more thing just after filling the screen with a black color, but before we take the contents of that contents of this uh, that contents of the screen memory and actually put it on screen, and that is we just need to tell all sprites to draw themselves onto the screen. That's what we're doing right here. Any sprite that is a member of all sprites is now being commanded to draw itself onto the screen. And at, that, at this point, let's save. Invoke the magic words. This should work. And run it and see if you get this. Green, green square running, running across. Let me know if you're not getting that, if, if, if that's not happening for you, and we'll figure it out. No, I'm not, but I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> OK. Yeah, well, I'm not getting the window either. All right. Are, what, what, what are you getting? Are you getting some kind of error message? Or... Yeah, um, it <laughs> says, my game is not recognized as an internal or external command. Ah, Operable. Cool. Our batch file. Python, not Pygame. Python. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I need to type Python instead of Pygame? No, it should be Python. Uh, Python space and then the name of your file, not Pygame. Python no. Lowercase? Yeah, all lowercase. I'll highlight it. On, uh, let's see if I can. I'm highlighting it on my screen right now. So uh, yeah, but use use the file name that that you you saved it. Uh, so player object has no attribute image. Hmm. Okay, let me scroll to uh, let me scroll to the player class. All right. All right. Uh, let me just check. Yeah. So I've got the entire player class is right there. It's on my. In my editor, it lines 11 through 22. Uh, I think it was because I didn't capitalize green. Oh, OK. No, nope. I lied. Green is defined image.get underscore self dot And what we'll do is we'll we'll do one more thing tonight and um, we'll figure out when we'd like to meet next, but I'm happy to continue on with this. But I do want to show one more thing. It's a fairly quick thing to do, it, but it and it's a little satisfying. It will be satisfying to do it just because it'll give you control over the square. Well, 
which is way more satisfying than just watching it travel by itself across the screen. Here, I'll move it over. I'll move things over so everybody can still see the code. But let me know how, how are things going there. Uh, line thirty-eight. Oh, oh man, I really needed to slow down. <laughs> Is it flying across the screen? Um, not yet. Oh, okay. I made lots of little errors here and there. Me too. All right. that, 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 that's practice. That's practice. And the interesting thing, of course, is that you are, you're also learning Python, but in a fun way, because uh, a lot of the tutorial programs, standard tutorial programs are kind of boring. I think games are way more fun. Yeah, it's uh, more hands-on. Yeah. Uh, okay. And it's more satisfying. And what I will do is I will uh, I'll post uh, I'll, I'll I'll post the code and uh, I don't want to go too much longer, but I do want to cover just the end. I want to cover adding some interactivity just for just so that yeah just so it's a little satisfying. So I got let mine me know to run. Who's still... I got oh, mine. Perfect. To run. Ah, that's great. But yeah, isn't that isn't that a great feeling that it, when it works? <laughs> but yeah, basically what's happened, yeah. The like what's really driving the player the player sprite right now is just contained all inside update and that's what in the next section basically what we're going to do is we're going to send different we're going to send the update message to different sprites and the each sprite is going to have its own bit of programming as to what to do when it receives the update message. So uh, what's going to happen is the player, the player, um, when the player receives the update message, it's going to check and see uh, if which, if you pressed an arrow key and move the player accordingly. And uh, the security guard sprites, on the other hand, when they receive the update message, they're not going to listen to the, they're not going to listen to your keystrokes because that that that's what controls the player. What they're going to do is they're going to be checking the player position and move themselves in the right direction to chase after the player. And that's the interesting, that's the idea is that you send the same update message to all the sprites, but each, each sprite, each sprite category just behaves differently as defined by its built in update function. And that's basically how we get. Uh, that's basically how we get the behavior of various characters in the game. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to stop the program. I'm going to do the last thing for tonight, and that is if you're in Visual Studio Code, I'm going to select the code under update. And depending on if, you, if you're on the Mac, uh, you're going to hit command slash. If you're on Windows, it'll be control slash. But what that will do is that will comment out all this stuff. I'm going to leave it there in comment form because you should be able to uncomment it later and play around with it so you can switch between the old code and the new code. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm not going to have the square just constantly moving to the right. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to have it respond to the user now. 
And the way I do that is I'm going to check to see every time this, the player gets the update message, I'm going to check to see which key, if actually, if the user is holding down a key, and if so, move the player in the appropriate direction. So let's handle the case of the left arrow key. And the way it works is there's this giant array. Pygame treats keys as a giant array of true or false variables, Boolean variables. And we can check if any of them are, are being pressed at the moment. So what I'm doing here is there's this giant collection of variables called keys. And I'm looking to see if the one that is marked, the one whose designation is, is the constant k underscore left, that means this is only true if the user is holding down the left arrow key. So basically I'm saying if the player, is, if the user is holding that, pressing the left arrow key and the sprite and the sprite is still to the left, is still to the right of the left edge of the screen, if the sprite is not going to go off the screen. Move the character left five pixels. That's what I'm saying right here. Reduce the, reduce the player's x coordinates by five. The code for the right arrow key isn't all that different. In fact, I'm going to base. I'm going to do some copying and pasting to make uh, make it to save me some typing and make the necessary changes. So for the right arrow key, I'm basically saying, look, if the, if the user is pressing the right key, the right arrow key, and the sprite, the sprite is still on the screen. So in other words, as long as, it, uh, as, long as its coordinates are less than the entire width of the screen minus the width of the sprite. So in other words, is this thing still on screen? Then yeah, move it increase its x coordinates by five or move it right five pixels. And once again, I'm gonna copy the code for the left arrow key to save myself some typing and write code for the up arrow key. And when dealing with up and down, we're dealing with the Y coordinate instead of the X coordinate. So if the player is pressing the up arrow key and um, the sprite is still below the top of the screen, yeah, then you can move up five pixels. And finally, the down arrow key. Copy the up arrow key code and just make the appropriate changes. In this case, I'm going to say, look, 
if the player is pressing the down arrow key and the sprites coordinates are less than the entire height of the screen minus the height of the sprite. So in other words, is this thing still on the screen? Then if that's the case, then you can move it down, increase its y coordinates by five. Then once you've done that, save it. Here's the crazy thing. We've actually added interact. We have just added interactivity. If I were to run the program right now, oh, what's going on with keys? Oh, I forgot one more thing. Let me add it up top here. I forgot to tell Pygame, get me the list of all the keys that are currently pressed. That's what this command does. So I created a vote. Get me the list of every key that's pressed right now and put it inside the variable name keys. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna check this entire list to see if they're true, or, uh, if each of these values is true or false. Is the user pressed? saying the left arrow key is the user pressing the right arrow key and the up arrow key and the down arrow key. If I run the, save, if I run the program now, I'll get the window, but notice, here, I'll move it out of the, I'll move things out of the way so you can still see all the code. Uh -oh. <laughs> there we go. All the code's visible and you can see my game window. Notice that the square is now dead center on the screen. I'm going to click on, I'm going to make sure I've clicked on the game window, but I'm now, I'm now using the arrow keys to move the player character around. And the best thing is I can also, because it checks all the keys, I can actually hold combos of up, down. I can hold the up, I can hold, you know, up and right, up and left. Joey, you know what this reminds me of? What? Adventure on the 2600. Yeah, exactly. All we need, <laughs> that crazy All we need is that crazy duck looking dragon. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, guess what? We have we, we, we have the basics of a video game right here. Like we at least have we now have a player character that is responding to responding to user input. Let me know if you're having trouble getting this to work. And notice that, of course, we're, I'm still holding the down arrow key. Notice that the code, we have constrained the player's motion to the limits of the screen. I can't move off the left edge of the screen. I can't move off the right edge of the screen. I can't move off the bottom and I can't move off the top. So I have limited the player to the boundaries of the window. And we did that by running these extra checks here. If the player, let's see, in this line here, we've basically said, look, if the player is, uh, if the player is pressing the down uh, down arrow key and the player is not at the is not is not already at the lower boundary of the screen, then yeah, you can move down five bits. Same deal here. Right? We check to see if 
the user has pressed the left arrow key. If the user has pressed the left arrow key and is not at the leftmost bound of the window already, then yeah, you're allowed, you can move the user five pixels to the left. How's everybody doing so far? Good. Okay. Has anybody not gotten it working yet? Um, well, I've got all the code in. I just haven't gotten it connected. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share this code. And uh, as soon as I have the, let's see, I've saved the recording to the cloud. So as soon as uh, Zoom has processed it, I'll share this as well. And um, we can figure out when we want to have, we can figure out when we want to have our next se session. I've, I've thrown, I've thrown a few of stuff at you and I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to eat up our entire evening either, but at least we have a, we actually have the basis of a video of a video game. In fact, defining the security guards will be quite similar to defining the player. It isn't that much more code, but this is you know this is a good this is a good stopping point. In the yeah, in the next in the next session, we just we're going to define the. Uh, we're going to define the security guards and we're going to define what happens when a security guard touches the player character or what we uh, or what we call in the what we call in game programming collision detection what happens when one sprite collides with another and how do we how do we detect that and how do we respond to it well, at the moment right now we've got we've at least got uh, we've at least got some interactivity we actually are able to draw a player character on the screen. We are able to move the player character around based on user input. And we can also constrain the player character's motion to the boundaries of the screen. Has anybody got any questions at this point? Uh, yeah, I, I still haven't seen my green guy. Oh. <laughs> I just moved on uh, with everything else, but I'm pretty sure it's somewhere within line 15-ish. Okay, and let's see. Specifically for line 15, uh, I think I didn't copy one of your comments or something, but it's sure. the image.fill uh, quotation screen. Yeah, it's- um... It's exactly like that, but it's saying that that's where I'm hitting the error. Or it says uh, no attribute image. Okay, and you've got self. I have uh, def in itself, yada yada, pie game sprite sprite in itself, self image. Like Do you have self inside parentheses inside yes. this one? Okay. Yes, it's separated correctly. Um, missing and semicolons. Intent. How about semicolons here and here? Basically, after class on the line that has class and the line that has def. Yes, and I can see that it's work. Uh, it's there because defining it as an object on the top of my screen. Hmm. Could you share your screen? Let's take a look. Let's take a look again. All right. Uh, can you unshare? Oh yeah. Here we go. Go for it. All right, yeah, self is there. And that's image with a lower case, yeah, image with lowercase i. Yeah, I look for spelling and everything. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, Phil. And are those both L's and not ones? I don't know. What line? Uh, line fifty. Your line fifteen. Now that's yeah. a very. That's a very rare error. That's an. That's typically an error that somebody from the era of typewriters, 
might make. They teach you as a shortcut that you can use the number one as a way of using instead of lowercase l back from the days of typewriters. Yeah, I've got a little a little to no experience there. Promise. Okay. Yeah, that's what I fit. Yeah, that's what I figured. Um, you, you you have to be from my generation to have been made to take typewriter class. Um, let's see. And yeah, this is one of those things where sometimes, yeah, you you'll see mysterious player pygame dot sprite dot lowercase s sprite for the first one, uppercase sprite for the second file, one. File game one pi thirty nine player equals. That's incomplete. There's no. Is that right? That should be. It should be lowercase player equals equals player. capital player. Yeah, and two. Yeah, and then parentheses. Joey, I apologize. I got to drop, but thank you very much for this. Okay. Well, Chris, I will. Uh, I, I'm going to message everybody, and we're going to. Uh, we'll we'll uh, figure out a time for next time, and I will send okay. everybody. The other thing is, I'll send everybody the code. Yeah, okay. I got I got your email, so I'm good for that. I'll get it. All right. Thank you so much, Joey. Really appreciate it. Glad to help and hope to see you next time. Okay, definitely. See ya. We'll figure out when that happens. All right, take care. All right, any, uh, let's see. You know what I will do is I'll, well, I'll send out the file, try running it because um, it's, it, it's probably, yeah, the thing is it, it's probably just a very small thing that we're not seeing right now. Oftentimes, oftentimes when you run into errors like that, let's see. Can I? Yeah, it's a matter of, Last player, lower. All of that normal? Or yeah. That shouldn't matter? No, that should be fine. That bit should. Oh. Exception of the current attribute error inside init. Self. Uh, now that's handy. I like this. Yeah, that is handy. I. Still green, right? Zero two fifty five zero. I am baffled by like. Yeah, lowercase. Yeah, that that is right. Self image. Is it player object has no image attribute image? Do I have to define image earlier? Oh, I found it. Oh, there we go. Transpose. Oh my goodness. There we go. There's a, a sad day. Transposed. Yeah, that happens. Yeah, half, half the yeah half of programming find yeah. book, <laughs> book and then look again and then keep looking. Yeah. Oh, what a beauty! Hey. And I made my up and down backwards. Okay, well, that's <laughs> it's progress. I can do that. Easy fix. Well, look, uh, everybody, when's a good um are monday nights good i'm like, good any i'm good any time around this time or time i mean it's not like well actually yeah some people are going out but it's not like there's much to do outside uh if if you really want to avoid the plague so <laughs> so uh let me uh let me see about uh if it's all right, next uh, next Monday is fine with me. I would love to continue with this, but what I'm uh, what I will do is I will send everybody my files and some extra notes, and even some suggestions for experimenting with this. Oh, that'd be awesome! With this, things like can you make this? Yeah, can you make this thing fly across the screen or go very slowly across the screen? And then some suggestions on how to play around with these if you play. And I will also share as soon as the video processes, which should be before the end of tonight. Usually Zoom's pretty good about processing the video fairly quickly. I will share everybody, uh, I will share the link with everybody so that you can watch the video as well. And of course, uh, you can email me. Uh, it'll be in the general email that I'll send. My email address will be in the general email that I'll send out to everybody who attended. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, please feel free. Uh, I'm actually paid to uh, to help program to help programmers. That's part of the 
that's part of the developer relationship uh develop yeah developer relations game so yeah all right sounds good okay well thank you thank you very much you've made this an excellent inaugural night for program reportables and uh i will see you soon i will announce the date very shortly so it should be next monday all right that's okay. fantastic all right thank you. the help it was a good time thank you so much take care everybody